Hola, boa noite. Carl Munson here with the Portugal show from expatsportugal.com. We've got some really good news today. Our YouTube channel has hit the magical 1,000 subscribers. So uh, great news for, for me and for us today. Um, after all the wonderful interviews and shows we've done together here, uh, we're glad to have reached 1,000 subscribers, which may, I, I, I was just hanging out and having a bit of a rough and tumble and, and a pile up with the kids just now before coming on air. actually lost track of time. And my son, he's eight years of age, and he watches these YouTube influencers. And they have, you know, I say to him, yeah, I'm a YouTube influencer. <laughs> yeah, right, Dad. <laughs> I, like, I like to think of myself as probably one of the oldest influencers on YouTube. And the guys he watches, Dan TDM, I don't know if you've heard of him, talks about gaming. Millions of views per show, millions of subscribers, and it makes my tiny little 1,000 subscribers for um, Expats Portugal's YouTube channel look really tiny. But believe me, it's such a wonderful achievement uh, for us, and it's a sign for me anyway that we're doing something along the right lines to help people in their efforts to enjoy life in Portugal, uh, whether they're here already or whether they're on their way. And as you probably know, um, this this uh, evening edition is aimed at our transatlantic friends. So if you want to know anything about Portugal, uh, I will do my best to help you. And I'm sure the people watching uh, will chip in as well. Tell you a little bit about what's going on on tonight's show in just a moment. But let's go to those lovely people uh, who are congratulating us. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Elsa, congratulations on that milestone. I think everyone's referring to here. Thank you so much, Elsa. Appreciate it. How's Wales this evening? Um, and how's Barbara treated you? <laughs> Gary Austin. Hey, Gary, I've enjoyed our interaction on Facebook today. Uh, yay. Well done. Cheers, Gary. Uh, and you're a big part of that, obviously. Um, with all the wonderful sort of ambassadorial work you do and you're showing up tirelessly on the shows as well. I'm being an absolutely kingpin position on our expat man cave on a Friday evening as well. So thank you. Back to you. Right back at you, Gary. Uh, well done, us, I'd say. Hola, bon night. Tadush, uh, 1,000 huge. It is, Steve. Thank you for seeing it that way. And it was you and I, right, that were, that were having the conversation about Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis because uh, the new stray dog, because one's called Jimmy. It seemed right to me to call the other one uh, Terry. So we've got a Jimmy Jam and a Terry Lewis. And uh, you seem to understand that, which is great. Uh, that made it a, a, um, an aging geezer quite happy. Um, well done, says Dominique. And thank you to you, Dominique, for your uh, devotion uh, and um your regular attendance to this endeavor. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And from Lauren uh, in North Carolina, by night from Raleigh. I think we got that right now. <laughs> I, I get the right right pronunciation and then I forget in the heat of the moment, in the, like a rabbit in the headlights. Which was it? Raleigh, Raleigh? I think it's Raleigh. Um, hi, Prestatin weather is calm and a bit balmy. Okay, so maybe like tonight. Um, I don't know if you saw the video that's on uh, the Happy Homesteaders and Positive Portuguese Positive News group that we run. I uh, took a shot of the um, of the beautiful crescent moon uh, tonight that, that greeted us when we got back from a, from an afternoon and early evening out tonight. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, the, re the as we opened the car doors, the the really loud volume of a cicada or a pear making their incredible sound. And yeah, so it's balmy and and calm after the storm here. And it may be that that those are the ideal conditions for cicadas. You know, they 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 they're glad to be back out in the open and out of the uh, you know back back into the calm air and away from the wind and the rain. And they're just singing their little hearts out whilst looking for a mate, perhaps. Who said? And yes, Raleigh, you said it right. Fantastic, Lauren. I do like to get these things right. I really do. Valerie, thank you for our interchange exchange today. Uh, on on uh, Facebook as well. Um, I have posted something up on Facebook saying if I have offended anyone on um, Facebook, here is my complaints book. <laughs> it's a virtual one. Um, and I came so close, I have to say, uh, to, f to making an entry myself. You know, this ongoing saga I've got with Vodafone. I know a few of you have made um, a little bit of a note um, about Vodafone <laughs> now after my experiences with them um, I, I you know I, I'm not in the business of, of of knocking people for the sake of it or being critical but I mean there's just one very practical piece of advice with you with Vodafone is that they lock their phones and uh, I, I they lock them to their their um, network so you have to see the contract out or pay to get out of the locking um, and I got into a situation which which escalated today and it's ongoing 
but it was the first time in my in my <laughs> time here in Portugal because I think that you know I was thinking when I see in every shop window or a sticker behind the counter that says uh, the uh, Livro de Reclamacion, the the complaints book. I'm thinking, no, surely nobody needs to do that. Can't you just sort this out like human beings and have a chat? And I, I couldn't today with this guy who phoned me from Vodafone, um, basically making me stay. Well, not making me stay. That wouldn't be right. That wouldn't be a responsible thing to say. But he made me an offer I couldn't refuse and not in a good way, quite frankly. Um, I, I thought I'd done with them because they, they they were just, just very quickly with Vodafone. And thank you, Valerie. Uh, well done. Congrats on the uh, thousand subscribers. Uh, I do appreciate that, Valerie. And I have to say, I do enjoy our exchanges here and on Facebook. Um, oh, and Sean Heider says, I have 34 TikTok followers. <laughs> Way to go, Sean. That's 34 more than me, uh, for sure. <laughs> she said, what you do is more useful, for sure. Congratulations on one car. I appreciate it, Sean. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so Vodafone, um, when I moved house, just, just, to, just to give you a little bit of background here, from the point of view that, you know, it's maybe useful to you to know these things if you are thinking of switching providers and you're already here, or if you're on your way here, which should you have, you know, NOS, Mayo or Vodafone, and I'm sure others are available, but those are the three principal ones. Uh, when I moved house in the last two or three months, Voda couldn't uh, provide the fiber uh, transfer to the new house that we're in now. Um, and we're going through a nice Mayo connection now, a uh, cabled connection, just to make sure it's nice. And I shouldn't say things like that, should I? But to make sure it's nice and steady. And um, so that was all well and good. And I asked Vodafone to to cancel, obviously, their fiber optic part because they couldn't provide it. <clears throat> and um, that they did. But they canceled my phones or two phones. Me and Mrs. M have a phone each with them. And they canceled those as well. Um, and so I went into the Vodafone shop and my mate um, Diogo in there, um, what's happening with the phones? And he told me there was some weird 5G switchover or something, which Mrs. M didn't like the sound of that. Um, but um, I thought, OK, so there's a general problem in, in Anadia. And then it still didn't come back after days and days and days. And I'm thinking, well, OK, in Portugal, you know, it's a little bit more leisurely. No need to make a fuss about it. And they cut my phone off, uh, both of our phones off. And... Um, so when I went in and discovered this, you know, I said, but the these phones haven't come back on like you, like it, I thought they might. Oh, no, no, we cut them off when we cut the fiber off. So I thought, OK, fair game. I'll go to Mayo and start a new contract with Mayo. And I was a bit peeved because I had loads of loyalty points and I was quite happy with the phone service but and a bit peeved that they cut me off. And then I got into a massive rigmarole of tra transferring the numbers, you know, to keep your number uh, and then to unlock the phone. And I thought they'd do that out of goodwill for cutting me off. And then I had a, a call and everything was going kind of OK. Uh, Mayo were about to activate, I think, in these last few days because of the photocopy of my passport that I had to give as part of the process. But anyway, um, th uh, this week, I'm thinking the next couple of days, Mayo are going to activate. We're going to port the numbers across. Everything is going to be fine. I got a call from Vodafone this morning um, from a special department with an actual phone number on the screen. And I have access now as a special case, I think, is what he told me by the end of our a uh, rather heated half hour on, on the phone together. Um, but um, he said, no, you, you, you're you in a contract with us and you can not you can leave, but you'll have to pay a penalty. And I said, but you, it was your mistake. You cut me off. And now you're penalizing me for your mistake. Yes, but you're contracted to us and uh, you've, you've got to stay contracted or pay to get away. And the guy, you know, you know how these things are when you it's like one human being to another and, it, and there is the wall, the glass wall of, well, actually, it's not very invisible, is it? It's very visible. It's very tangible. These are the rules. And he was giving it to me straight. And whether or not he felt comfortable about doing that, I don't know. But he, that's, you know, and I, I don't like to have a go at people who are just trying to make a living, basically. So, you know, I, I, but I was, I needed to say to him, look, it's your mistake. And now you're penalizing me. And I got to that moment where I'm thinking, Hmm. Livre de reclamation. Shall I go to the complaint? Shall I escalate this to the complaints book? And I'm interested to hear from you. Have you ever used the complaints book as an expat in Portugal? Tell us about that tonight, because I'm sure that'll be interesting um, to people watching all around the world. Um, and I said, look, okay, I don't normally do this, but I don't th feel like I've got any choice. Um, I, I, I think I need to put this in the um, complaints book because you're penalizing me for your mistake. That's not right. I know I'm, I'm no, I'm, it, contracted to you technically which i discovered later 
I'm contracted again because they switched my phone back on, which automatically put me into another 12 month contract with them. So again, their mistake as far as I see it. And I'm thinking I've got all these kind of legs to stand on as it were legally, but what am I going to do? Am I going to go to a lawyer? Am I going to fight it out? Am I going to spend hours on the phone? And I am I going to write letters and then translate them into Portuguese and send them by registered post? No, I'm not. And I told this guy, you know what's going to happen here, don't you? You know, you've got me over a barrel. And basically what I'm going to do is be with you for these next 11 months, as you suggest, and hate being with you and tell everybody what a rubbish company you are, which is what exactly what I'm doing now. So um, there you go. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't see myself as one to bad mouth. It's, you know, it's not a personal thing. I didn't, I said, you know, we, we ended on good terms, me and this fellow on the phone. There's no point me letting off steam about him, but I made it perfectly clear what I thought about uh, Vodafone. And when I was telling my, uh, my man, my Mayo man, who I think might um, uh, help me, and I've promised him my business in 11 months' time. But he said, you know, I'll speak to my manager and we'll see if we can suspend your new contract. Because, you know, basically I might end up with two contracts now because of Vodafone's mistake. And um, he said, you know Vodafone are British, don't you? <laughs> I was like, no. It's like, oh, expat karma or something like that. But there I am now uh, suffering, not at the hands of some Portuguese problem, but actually a British company uh, with some uh, nasty practices by the sound of it. So I'll leave it there about Vodafone. But be careful, okay? When when you're when you're taking out your mobile um, contract, contract is with a big C here. The, the the way that contracts and the law work here, I believe, uh, and 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 don't don't take this sort of verbatim um, for definite tablet in stone kind of um, information. But my understanding and what I've heard is is it that in Portugal, you know, the the common law contract, as I understand it from UK, is that you have a contract with another person. But contracts in Portugal are mediated by the government. So the government has a stake in what people agree with each other as well. And um, big C for contract here. If they will, I, I, as I understood it, what this guy was saying, you know, they will enforce the contract. Uh, it comes before customer service. It's the <laughs> legal principle that, that he was gaming on, not like, oh, well, I can see how we've messed you about. Sorry about that. I said, are you going to give me any compensation for, for messing me about? Uh, no, <laughs> no, we just, you know, we, we, you are contracted to us and that's it. So there you go. I will leave it there now. Um, who else is saying good evening? Uh, Arts Tim, keep on growing. Thanks, Arts Tim. Nice to hear from you tonight. Uh, um, and we'll do our best to do that and serve more and more people. Uh, and like, like I said in the show notes tonight, this is all about keeping your Portuguese pilot light lit, um, especially in these difficult times. You know, I know for you across the, the Atlantic there, if you've got plans and designs to come to Portugal, that's kind of hard at the moment, isn't it? Not being able to come to the country even. So we're doing our best to keep the fires burning over here for you uh, in the best possible. Yeah, that's not a very good thing to say about Portugal, is it? No, scrub that, strike that. Very poor choice of words. But keep your pilot light lit. Uh, for your Portuguese dream over here in Portugal. So we'll do all we can um, to help you here. Neil's here as well, uh, taking the mickey out of me in the expat man cave, I think a little bit earlier on. Typical Virgo or whatever you are, Neil. Um, evening all, says Neil, and he is leading the tasting. The oh, Neil, you won't believe what hap what's happened to me with this wine. Um, Continent, I think, have replaced all their wine offers with some kind of autumn specials of blankets and ho household items. I think they've moved all the cheap wine away, all the, all the bargains, long before Christmas to stop people buying bulk, buying cheaper wines now that Christmas is coming. The second branch I went to today, I couldn't find the bargain wine selection in which your wonderful Patria, um, it's called the Patria Selection uh, Red from Alentejo, where I thought there were loads of them the last time I went. And I just, it just like it was disappeared. It was a weird, like, um, like some sort of psychological drama. I went back to the shelf where I thought the wine would be, and it had been replaced with household items like fleece blankets and stuff. And I thought, hold on a minute. This is something strange is happening here. You know, like the, the um, <laughs> yeah, like in a psychological thriller. Um, and I've been to a second store and they've done exactly the same thing, same plan all over the country, it would seem. I've got to think very carefully about what I'm going to do for tomorrow night. But uh, Neil is leading the way tomorrow night with the tasting. Do join us in the Good Morning Portugal Wine Club tomorrow from nine. That's after our webinar, where it's the big webinar tomorrow night, the D7 visa and the NHR, the non-habitual residency expertise from Gilda Pereira, joining us on the Portugal Calling 
Zoom webinar, not on this service, but on the Zoom webinar that you have to book via expatsportugal.com and the premium members um, get priority on that. That's if it's not already fully booked, a very popular one uh, tomorrow night. Um, you saw it. You saw my <laughs> You saw my complaints book. Have you put anything down there yet, Valerie? And have you filled in? I mean, I'm guessing as someone who runs a business in Portugal, you've got to have one as well yourselves. And it does it does change the game, I believe, doesn't it? When when somebody asks for it, um, I think people maybe the proprietors whatever think again. And then if it comes to it, I think you have to it has to be written right in Portuguese, and it has to be responded to within 72 hours. It's a very formal thing, isn't it? Very interesting. Uh, might be mole crickets. Um, I'm guessing that's in relation to the Chicada comment uh, tonight. So they might be mole crickets that are making that incredible sound. How can something this big, folks, make a noise that you can hear across a whole valley? Nature is amazing, is it not? That's, I think it's incredible. Lauren, quick question. We've heard contradicting advice on whether to bring more cash or just use credit cards in Portugal. What should we actually plan for? Good question, Lauren, and I think that will attract the attention of some of our expats here in answering that. Uh, we'll we'll keep dipping back into that, but my first go at that, um, whether you, I, I would balance, have options. That's that's my advice: is have options in every walk of life here, um, because not because it's Portugal, but because you don't know the territory, and it's good to have not you know not so many options that become stressful in its own way but i've i i tr i like to have a little reservoir of cash that i carry with me i think it's really important to do that um are you talking about bringing a massive wad of cash or are you talking about because you know there are rules about that of course aren't there or are you talking about when you're out and about should you carry cash and or credit cards um the the system that i found really helpful when i first got here was revolut and i know there are other systems like that now like curve um transfer wise not quite the same but a lot of people are very fond of transfer wise for mo moving cash around especially um i would and the, the and the, and the thing to do is to open which you probably already have done in your in your um processes is open a portuguese bank account so obviously you'll have the um debit credit card of that a, a bank account as well but balance like we were saying to wonderful sandy this morning from uh, the Suara uh, Slow Living Center in Aveiro. It's all about being calm, but being balanced as well. So a bit of both, I would say. I wouldn't, I wouldn't make a call and go one way or the other because uh, that's just a little bit too dangerous. Have some cash for those situations where, the, you know, there are shops in Portugal that just don't, when you get to the counter, no multibanco. You know, they only deal in cash. And I, I can't say I blame them, actually. Um, and, and you don't want to be in a, a tricky situation. Although that said, if you find yourself in such a situation, they're very likely to say to you, oh, OK, just the cash machine's just down the road there or pay next time or something really wonderful like that. But at the moment, my first response and others may come and certainly from the community here, um, I would go for balance, a, a bit of both. And that's if I've understood your question correctly okay tonight on the show then uh, i think a lot of us know what the weather's like just by having experienced it today and sticking our heads out of the window but, but for the folks abroad let's just have a look at the weather um in the capital for example just to give you an idea as a, as a comparison um i think that's quite a, a nice thing to do don't don't need to dwell on it for too long but just to give you an idea of what the temperature is like and uh, for lisbon i have done bilingual <laughs> <laughs> I've done the, um, the the Fahrenheit as well as the centigrade. That's if it will load. I've got a lot of widgets working away here. So there's a, a lot of information on the screen that needs to load up. Uh, while it's doing that, I'm going to tell you as well about the trash traveler. Really interesting fella who's walking the coast of Portugal. And our focus on tonight is a focus on uh, Campo de Orique, which I think we'll go to first because it was a question in the expats Portugal forum. And we might not even do weather at this at this rate. Uh, with how slowly this, I was, you see, I knew I shouldn't have mentioned Mayo and how good my um, internet connection is. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Mayo maybe heard me and switched it, turned it up a bit. Lisbon tonight, 15 degrees and partly cloudy in the moonlight, the crescent moon, uh, uh, 59 Fahrenheit, 15 degrees centigrade. And we've had a high there of 19 and 66 respectively. The way the week is looking in, in the wake of Barbara, um, is another rainy day tomorrow in the capital, and uh, it's going to be sunny on Friday. That is worth remarking upon. 
you know, it's the weather here is like suddenly all is forgiven. You know, you're facing a, a dismal morning and day and it doesn't stop raining. You think, when will this ever end? And then in an hour's time, it might be blazing sunshine, beautiful Portuguese blue sky, and it's dried up all the rain like Inti Wincy Spider, and you would never know. The, 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 the contrast is quite extraordinary sometimes uh, in this country. So there you go. There's a little bit of, look, of a look at the weather. I want to, to check out Campo Doric. And again, folks, uh, do chip in. If you know this part of town of Lisbon, uh, let me know because the I'll just do a little bit of a zoom in on our expatsportugal.com forum. Great place for information. Um, you know, as, as I'm sure you're aware, um, you will um, recognize that I'm a, quite a, a heavy user of social media. Oh, it doesn't want to load up. Let me try that again. Let me know. I think it's probably because I I have too many things open at a time. Here we go. Yeah. Um, just just to give you an idea of what, what we're looking at, what we're sharing here. And uh, let me get rid of that confusing background. Here we go. Um, and I'll put that large on the screen there. Uh, expatsportugal.com uh, forward slash community, which is our forum. And um, you'll see some of the things that are being discussed here. And on the right, we have radio, our podcast. You can listen to our podcast while you're, while you're checking out the forum here. Absolutely free to join at entry level. Um, so, yeah, free to, to make use of all of these topics here. Um, announcing expatsportugal.com on the airwaves. That's over on the right here, as you can see, that, and that plays the podcast. Um, Ask Our Expats, that's a great new feature. Delighted to be one of those. Why I like living in Portugal. Uh, the, uh, thanks to premium members, spam alerts, so we keep it nice and clean on there and, and an enjoyable experience. Uh, NIF, tax number, how to apply. Pretty good, huh? Dutch disability benefits in, in Portugal and the IRS. So it goes into some specialist detail. Look at this today, dying in Portugal. Now, I know that's not something we want to talk about necessarily, but over here, I have have heard some horror stories and scare stories. Worth getting that a plan figured out. You know, when the time is right, uh, and there's never a good time, is there? But it's something that's worth thinking about um, because I have heard of – it's very different here. That's that's how I put it tonight. Um, it's very different in how what happens after somebody passes away in Portugal. Um, and we, 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 we did do a, a, a feature on that uh, some while ago based on – uh, Deb's experience, a very difficult experience that she had. So, again, you can find out more here on the forum. Uh, mobile, I could have written this one, mobile network problems, Portugal slash UK. And loads and loads more topics. The, the as, And as I, said, as I was saying before, look at that, how to import a car. Hello from Massachusetts, a real estate agent referral, pilot's eye view arriving in Lisbon. Great stuff, driving, driving from Santander. That was a popular one. Um, so all sorts on there. And, you know, when I first got involved with the forum there, I was thinking, forums are a bit old-fashioned, aren't they? And um, the great thing I've discovered about a forum is that you can find your thread again. You can find the information you want. And uh, you know, so with social media, which I, you know, has become my preferred medium in many ways, you know, I, I love uh, uh, the, the fun I have on social media, <laughs> but apart from days like today in many ways. But um it, it, it you blink and you miss it like where was that thing where was that comment that someone made that was really helpful about the vet in anadia or whatever and you you can't find things on social media it's really momentary isn't it and then with forums they're properly organized you know and i mentally i'm not a very organized person you may have noticed but it, that's that's to me is probably a better way of finding information sorted by a topic you can search for it in the forum and it's not going to get lost like it might do in social media okay a little bit of um uh <laughs> Okay, a little bit of feedback about the Vodafone uh, situation, and I'm sure there'll be some some answers to your uh, question, Lauren. Before we go and have a, a look at Campo do Rique in the capital, uh, did Vodafone <laughs> give you the Sicilian offer? Hey, stay with us or sleep with the fishes. You know what, Charles? They they did it in a commercial sense. I felt very aggrieved about how they had me over a barrel, and I just what what could I do except save my dignity? and not let it bother me too much. Because I think that's what it comes down to. In the end. It's not the end of the world. It really isn't the end of the world. There are far more important and worrying things going on in the world. But it's just like, come on, you guys. That's just not fair or right. But, you know, I'm not going to let it bother me, apart from telling you all about it tonight. Painful story. Complaint book. What exactly is that? I hope I've explained to some extent what that is about now, Steve. Um, actually, I opened up an article um, 
called How to Complain in Portugal. I, I think I need to do a feature on that on the morning show. I think we'll, we'll delve into that. We'll do a little bit of research and we'll give you um, an exact answer to that question. So that's great. Uh, and I said, I'm not very, uh, very good uh, at organizing myself. <laughs> so I'll need to make, I'll make a mental note. Um, but do remind me, Steve, um, if, if that hasn't been forthcoming. Uh, that's what I'm going to remember after today's um, <laughs> after today's experiences and threatening to go there. Uh, Chris, hi, Chris, uh, Chris Roberts. Like they say here on the farm, service is what the bill, bull gives to the cow. It felt like that. <laughs> well, I don't know what that feels like, but you I, get, I know I know you know what I mean. Uh, Shauna, depending on the US election, may try to stow away in luggage to get there somehow. It's coming to that, isn't it, Shauna? Uh, we'll have to meet you on a beach somewhere, won't we? And <laughs> figure out a way of getting you lovely people over here uh, somehow. Um, yes. Should we not go there tonight, the US election? I think it's being covered in the media, isn't it, in America? Uh, it might be on the TV. Um, every time you amend your package. Ooh, uh, can't say that, Neil. Um, did you do that on purpose? Every time you amend your package, you commit to a new contract, i.e. 20 months into a two-year contract. You may well get an offer from your provider with something you can't refuse without realizing, yes, you've just signed up to a completely new 12 or 24-month contract. Crooks the lot of them. I didn't say it. Neil is. And I've got a lot of sympathy with that sentiment. And yes, I can see exactly how they would do that. They turn my phone back on to, <laughs> to, to, uh, in order to transfer it and that started a new contract, is what my Mayo guy was saying. Unbelievable. Um, we'll miss the wine tasting as I'm working, but next week, eek. Um, okay, working from home due to Welsh COVID lockdown. So we'll be able to join. There's a silver lining to the cloud of lockdown in Wales then. So you'll be able to join the morning sessions. Fantastic. Um, I'm glad to hear it, Elsa. Sorry for the reason, but I'm glad to hear we'll have your company. And uh, just out and about. Okay, so just out and about, Lauren. Yeah, I, I think these expats here are going to agree with me with that. Have a little bit of backup cash. You know, you, you don't want to be carrying around so much cash that you're worried about it, stuffing it down your sock and all that sort of thing, or, or in a little, you know, one of those concealed belts. But enough. I was thinking about this yesterday, and I think, you know, 50, 100 euros in cash is going to get you out of trouble in most situations in Portugal. You know, a taxi or, you know, to pay for your meals or whatever. Um, and then, you know, until you get to a cash machine again. So I carry 50 or 100 in cash is my, is my from my personal experience, suggestion. And one or two or three types of electronic payment. The reason I say that is because hopefully you'll have your Portuguese bank card by then. Um, but if you have foreign ones, they're not always accepted. Um, so you could try one or two of your, you could try your credit card, which is more likely to be accepted than your, uh, perhaps your American debit card. Um, so options, options, balance. That's the way forward, in my view. Uh, Chris is saying, Chris Roberts, who we've already mentioned tonight, but from a cold and rainy Midwest USA. Good, good afternoon to you over there, Chris. Uh, will Portugal take me as an ass? <laughs> Has anybody thought of this? Um, that is such a funny, but like not funny question, isn't, isn't it, Charles? That's quite extraordinary. Um, yes, what? Well, because you feel so aggrieved with the result that your country doesn't no longer reflects your political views, and you feel threatened by it. I mean, I, it's a joke, but it's also a reality, isn't it? That some people are being threatened. You know, are in a life feeling in a life-threatening situation because of their politics in the U.S. And this is this is ordinary a reason to become an asylum seeker. That is that is a poignant question, my friend. Uh, tonight uh, here on the Portugal show said in jest but we know what what things are often saying when they're said in jest okay to stop me um, going on too much and not sticking to the subject matter which is what completely happened last night we meant to do the trash traveler guy um, but we didn't do it in the morning then we didn't do it in the evening so I'm definitely doing it tonight but not until we have gone to this rather lovely um, article about uh Campo de Oric. And let me move my tabs around, so to speak. I'm not talking about my cigarettes here for you British people. Uh, I'm talking about Portugal Exposure's Discover More article about Campo de Oric. Actually, first, before I go, though, I need to tell you what the question was uh, from the forum for this. Uh, and it was, um, let me see. Oh, it's 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 lost in, 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 the, in the pile of programs that I put on this. Let's have a look. Um, it was a question from somebody who'd had a nice time in Campo Doric, and they were thinking of living there. 
okay and they wanted to know our view about that so i said i would bring it have a look myself and bring it up on the show and see what other people thought about that so <laughs> i have i was saying what a brilliant way it was to organize things wasn't it <laughs> <laughs> and then I've lost it now. But that's me, uh, folks, and not the forum. And that's so bizarre um, because I, I'm sure I set that up um, before the, the beginning of the show. There, But anyway, they want to know about Campo do Arik in in Lisbon. I'm sure we can be of some assistance with that. So let me bring up this um, article that uh, shares a little bit of insider advice about that part of the capital. Hidden Gems of Lisbon's Campo de Auric. Uh, let me see if you can definitely see this on your screen. Yes, you can. Let me just pop myself next to it, if you don't mind. That's a bit more reassuring to me. Uh, I'm not going to read that, the whole thing. I mean, you, I think this is a good resource. Um, and, and one of the first things it tells you is how to get there, and you will be on the legendary, iconic 28 tram, for one thing. So that's a good reason. Reason number one to 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 uh, base yourself in or near Campo do Auric, uh, beyond the St George's Castle, uh, Geronimus Mos Monastery, and the Pastéis de Belém. Don't overlook local gems, chic boutiques, historic cafes, lush gardens, and typical restaurants. The neighbourhood Campo do Auric offers both traditional and modern experiences of Lisbon as a cosmopolitan city. Just hop on the twenty eight tram the aforementioned and discover things to do in Campo do Auric, one of Lisbon's most desirable neighbourhoods. Sounding good already. I could leave it there, couldn't I? This was written last year um, by Paulo Tavares for Portugal Exposure. Discover more. And I will publish the link um, with the show notes and wherever else I can. Uh, so, yeah, get, get the 28 there. Uh, and you can, on the, the 28 tram, that is, you can save time and money with a Lisbon card. Where's mine? Um, I've, I've had a reason to flash this a couple of times. Um, this week but there's 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 mine this is incredible the, the fellow i was talking to on monday night is green trouble is the green screen is scrambling it okay uh but the Lis lisboa viva card apparently for 40 euros you can pretty much go anywhere in and around lisbon for 40 euros and the, the system is great there so that's another thing to do put that alongside your credit cards lauren the lisboa uh, Viva card. It's a plastic one. It's like a proper credit card, and you charge it up on the chip uh, on the machines. Very, very good value. Okay, so um, yeah, they're recommending you do the same. Things to do in Campo do Auric, uh, and there there are some wonderful visuals here, which include the Casa Museo Amalia Rodriguez, Queen of Fado Museum dedicated to her to 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 her and her work. So that's that's reason number two. Amalia uh, Rodriguez, the world's are they? Are there, I think at least I, I've got it down as well. I just know her as Amalia, and that's why I'm questioning this, this the second. I'm sure they've got that right, but forgive me. I thought it's Rodriguez, uh, but they're saying Rodriguez here, the world's greatest singer of Portuguese fado music. Her voice came to personify the tones of Sodad, the the homesickness that Portuguese people have. It's more than that, though. It's it's homesickness squared or cubed. Uh, that is the heart of Fado. The house where Amalia lived since the 1950s in Campo de Arique is now open to the public. That's going to be a great place to go. Her singing career began at 18 when she won a Queen of Fado competition, a title that has been attributed to her ever since. From then on, her fame grew in, first in the taverns of downtown Lisbon and eventually throughout the world. Endless awards, tributes, medals, letters, and some of her most legendary outfits are on display there. Her voice resounds continuously in the whole house to remind visitors why she is truly immortal. You'll have to be a fan in that case, but who wouldn't be? I mean, that is such a great experience. So uh, the, the reasons are piling up thick and fast. Uh, there is also the Casa Fernando Pochá, uh, Fernando Pessoa is one of Portugal's most important poets. We have covered him on the morning show. And so you can, if you want to uh, gen up on that, uh, you can go back into our archive and hear that. He's mostly, most widely recognized name in Portuguese literature worldwide. The house where the poet lived the last few years of his life is now open to visitors in Campo do Arique as well. Its most valuable asset is Pessoa's private library, consisting of 1,300 titles in total, over half of them in English, interestingly. At that point, I need to have a little sip of British tea here. Bear with me whilst you... Um, actually, let me just find you a nice visual to look at. Um, 
I don't know. Is that? Oh yeah, there's the Mercado. The my, my, that's not the cemetery. I don't want to leave you looking at a picture of a cemetery particularly. Let's have a sip of tea. Oh, this program and the morning program should be sponsored by a tea producer, PG or Tetley or Yorkshire or somebody like that. But actually, it's English breakfast by Little. It feels like I haven't mentioned Little for a very long time. What's happening? Um, OK, so the Prazer Cemetery, it is considered an open air museum because of the architectural works and funer funerary sculpture. I think I said that right. Prazer Cemetery is the final resting place of some of the country's most illustrious figures, artists, authors, and government figures. So, um, yeah, I guess it's like the Highgate Cemetery, possibly. Or, yeah, um, I'm, I'm, str <laughs> I'm struggling to think of other famous cemeteries, forgive me. H Highgate is the one I know. Um, where to eat in Campo de Rig? The restaurants and cafes in Campo de Rig are a fine excuse for exploring the neighbourhood, and they give you a few there as well. So I would say, looking at the what's on offer there, culturally, historically, and because it's just a beautiful place, and, you know, it, it like brilliantly positioned within the capital, it's looking good for Campo de Rig. And I'll check your comments as well to see if anyone else has anything to add to that. But look, the market is beautiful as well. Smaller and more local. Uh, the famous Mercado Ribera downtown. The market balances old school and innovative gourmet and more humble snacks, Portuguese and international cuisine. So that, am I right? Maybe that the, the Mercado de Ribera, isn't that the timeout market? And have they snuck that into this article? Um, or is, is that a part of Campo de Rig? Um, if you prefer to uh, stay in a local neighbourhood rather than the main touristy ones when visiting Lisbon, then San Bento Hotel in Campo de Rig is a good option. So that's worth knowing as well. Go do a recce at the San Bento the hotel has been refurbished recently and is very well located in the neighborhood and near all public transport. Less than five minutes walk from Metro and bus, about a 30 minute walk to the city center. I think that's a rogue picture of the market, Mar Mercado de Ribera. So on that little look at the moment, that would say to me, cool place to live in Lisbon. Um, I personally... Um, I find it a bit intense being in the heart of Lisbon. And if I were to be considering a place in the, within easy distance of Lisbon, I'd be thinking of south of the river. And I've said this before, but there's there's often a snobbery, isn't there, associated with north and south of the river, of, of cities all over the world, and a different vibe, you know, either side of the river. Um, and traditionally, I think, you know, Almada, the, the, the um, district on the other side of the water from the, the the picture the side of the river that we all know of Lisbon is where the workers come from and it's you know it's like everyday Portuguese folks live on on the south side and on the north side it's where you know the, the real heart and thrum throb of the city is um, but you can get across the water on the ferry for pennies and within minutes really and I don't know why more people don't consider that. I really don't. And I mean, that's how what happened to us by chance. But Casillas, for example, I foresee, this is a little property tip from me now, I foresee the area known as Casillas right opposite, get a beautiful view of Lisbon, obviously, from the other side of the water. You have a, an amazing fe feeling of being in real Lisbon and real Portugal and a little bit of the touristy stuff as well. It's just the timing is right, I think, for Casillas. If you invested in Casillas, you wouldn't be unhappy uh, in time to come. But, you know, it's a bit of a waiting game. And it's it's a bit gritty and, you know, like normal. <clears throat> if you want if you want picture postcard Portugal, then, yeah, Campo do Rico, I think, fair enough. And, you know, uh, what's it called? Shadow, is it? Th th those areas that, that, that are the pictures of of Lisbon and Portugal that everyone knows. I understand why people want to go there, but they very, they are very intense. Uh, and I think you have to have a certain kind of um, way of being to put up with just how constantly busy they are. Um, but, they, you know, if you like that sort of city buzz, fair enough. But I think striking distance is, is worth considering as well, rather than being in the heart of it. But, you know, I, I can't say a bad word about Campo de Arique. Let's see what else you, you're saying, folks, in your comments. I'm still chuckling in to myself about your comment, Charles. Uh, will Portugal still allow Canadians entry as EU took Canada off the safe list today? Cindy, you're telling me that. I didn't know that. 
Uh, I will look into that. Um, will uh, well, I'm, I don't know is the answer to that because that's the first I've heard of it. But it sounds like not, and I will find out. I will report on that in the morning. Thank you, Cindy, for that uh, incoming news there. And these sorts of things are just changing day to day. It feels like, aren't they? What a time! What a world we're living in. Um, we would take note of your little mentions better if you got the little jingle button working. What the the Oasis little by? Did you like that? Because I'm a bit embarrassed about the jingles I play. I have to say, uh, when I play them, especially in the expat man cave, the other man cavers uh, or cavemen, they could be called, couldn't they, kind of look at each other a bit uncomfortably. So I, I'm still, you know, the jury's out on the on the, um, on the the jingles. But I do have that little by little jingle, the little snippet of Oasis, and obviously waiting for the lawsuit to arise from that as well. But, okay, interesting, Chris. Um, I, I can crank that up, not tonight, but at a later date. If that's what you want, that's what you get. Um, not from today. Okay, so that I think is the answer to Canadians um, entering the EU. Uh, not from today. That's poor and bad news, I'm afraid. Uh, but I will I will um, bring you more on that. I'll look into that myself tonight and bring you more. I don't know how I missed out on that. Yes, I do. I was in wonderful Agada all afternoon. I've been off social media, off my smartphone, just like, you know, I, after my conversation this morning with the, with the slow living lady who says she hasn't had a smartphone for three, four, five months, I thought... I can do that for three hours, and <laughs> I did. And I've been off the grid, really, this afternoon. So I think that's on this day when I need to know that information for this moment tonight, I, that's the reason why I should always be on my smartphone. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I like a bourbon and whiskey. Can I join the man cave? Yes. And <laughs> is that you asking to, become, to, to be in the man cave as well, Sean? Everyone's invited. This is the thing about the expat man cave. It sounds possibly sexist possibly exclusive and it is neither i promise you what it is is a certain kind of sense of humor okay and we do put a little caveat i'll put it on for you now um what this is this is what we roll so everyone this is not for tonight but this is what we roll when we're this is how we roll and what we roll on the expat man cave this show may contain male adult humor not best suited to the easily offended and that's just to make sure you know when we're making silly jokes, pure old jokes, and when I say adult, it's a kind of oxymoron there, isn't there? The idea of um, male adult humour. <laughs> it's like puerile, so how could it be adult? But you see, it's of an adult nature. It's, it's, it's not really for kids. And I suppose it's a bit like a pantomime. The kids don't really understand it anyway. We're not just straight up disgusting. We like to think we have a sophisticated yet smutty way of being. Would that be a good way of putting it, Gary? Or, or, or come to my rescue, are you man cavers. <laughs> man child potty humour. Thank you, Charles. I couldn't have said it better myself and I wasn't saying it very well. And there you are with a four word description. It's not just an hour or two of that. I mean, we do, you know, we do discuss serious things like politics and film noir. You know, we, we, we're quite sophisticated in many ways. And we talk about our what we're drinking and we talk about what sort of week we've had in Portugal. Um, but it is, you know, from that kind of blokey, uh, humorous point of view, I hope, you know, to bring some some lightness to things and and and, and to have a, a group of best mates in the new country who, you know, you might not like their views but you feel a kind of kinship and brotherhood with them. So that's the idea. Um, and, you know, it, 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 no one is excluded. Um, people can exclude themselves <laughs> if they don't like it. That's that's how I see it, is like all are welcome if you like the vibe. And if you don't, then why, why would you be there? Um, it should say, says Chris, uh, male, adult and juvenile humour. But come on, guys, you've got to spell humour right with a U in it. Come on. I wonder how many um, cats that puts, puts among the pigeons. <laughs> I, I'm not right. I'm an Englishman. I can't write humour like that. Come on. Um, without the you in it. Um, but then I can make some cheesy joke. There is no humour without you in it. <laughs> did you see what I did there? <laughs> okay. But I do like that. Man-child potty humour. That is what it can resort to. And uh, we find ourselves uh, giggling like schoolboys at times with, with the utter ridiculousness of something somebody might have said which reminds us of you know long gone times of being a teenager <laughs> i hope that conveys the kind of atmosphere okay let's go look at um, trash traveler 
Um, wanted to, just to take a little bit of a leisurely look through a wonderful article uh, in which he is featured. And uh, again, I'm going to have to shift a few tabs around to make this happen for you technologically. I'm going to have a little sip on my tea and my wine as well um, before we go any further with this. Um, hope we've answered your question, Lauren, um, about the balance of um, cash and cards that you should carry around. Um, and then, you know, any other questions, fire them in. If we can't address them tonight, we will. And like I said, I'll look at the the Canadian uh, entry situation tomorrow. Uh, this courtesy of Jack Wolfskin. And you will see why in just a moment. Let me just tee it up so that you can see what's going on uh, and have a little read for yourself while I have a sip of tea. Bear with. E, that's good, mother. Very good. Um, that sounded a bit Monty Python, probably, didn't it, to some of you um, <laughs> Americans? Uh, Andreas No. I'm pr presuming that's how you pronounce NOE. Dropped out of his regular life and lives in a van off the coast of Portugal. And now, immediately, I'm thinking presumably he lives on the coast of Portugal. Living in a van off the coast of Portugal sounds very James Bond to me. Anyway, not only to surf, but above all, to take action against plastic pollution in the ocean and to persuade us to rethink our consumer behavior. We have forgotten how to make do when everything isn't immediately available. And I imagine he's striking a bit of a chord already with some of us here. Um, you're a German living out of a van in Portugal and you collect plastic garbage. How did you get here is the first question. Um, I don't know how much of this I'm going to read, but I just think it's an interesting talking point. I'll keep popping back to your comments to see what you think. Uh, and any, yeah, anything, any comments for our friends in the forum there uh, about Campo de Orique would be gratefully received as well. Um, this is how Andreas responds, the trash traveler in this jackwolfskin.com interview. I'm a molecular biologist and I love to travel a lot. While vacationing in Portugal, I decided to move here. Three years ago, I found work in a Lisbon laboratory where I conducted research into leukemia and then held a position as a medical consultant. Since living in Portugal, I have spent every free minute surfing, he says. In my first year here, I lived a completely normal life in an apartment, but I decided I wanted a more minimalistic lifestyle and to be closer to the water. So I moved into my VW minibus. This, he's living the dream, isn't he, for many people? I had always dreamed of being able to jump right into the waves before and after work. Uh, and again, I mean, live, hold on a minute. Peggy, the old dog, the old stray, is having some sort of sneezing fit here. She's actually curling up again on a cushion she shouldn't be on. Mrs. M will go mad if she sees that. Um, do you have that dynamic in your house where one person is more the dog lover and they let the dog sleep on things they shouldn't, much to the consternation of the other? That's what happens here. Anyway, Andreas wanted to, a lifestyle where he could jump in and out of the water before and after work. Suddenly, I was confronted each day with plastic and garbage. It struck me while in the supermarket how much disposable plastic we actually use each day. <coughs> Excuse me. And it is crazy, isn't it? Come on, let's face it. Since then, I've increasingly attempted to live without it. How does he? And if, if, I were, if I had my little jingle, I'd play it now because you go to Lidl and wouldn't it be great if there was more of a market ethic in there where you could, you know, help yourself to stuff and put it in bags that you brought yourself, you know, reuse your bags. All this, all the vegetables, you know, almost individually wrapped is crazy. Um, how did you get the idea to collect garbage? Was there a key moment? When you surf on the beaches around Lisbon in the winter, you notice how much garbage washes up from the storms in the Targush River, which flows into the sea here. Then you find yourself literally surfing in plastic and garbage. This proved to be the decisive point for me to rethink my career. I no longer felt truly satisfied working in the biomedical field. If we continue to produce and consume as we've been doing, then in another 20 to 30 years, none of us will be happy. So he's leading the way. There he is on his fabulous VW camper and some, um, some garbage as you guys call it. I would call it rubbish <laughs> or refuse. But there he is. Um, Andreas, no, a.k.a. the trash traveler, moved into his VW minibus to live a minimalist lifestyle and to be closer to the water. And he's got a little beagle dog by the look of it. Well, that's just randomly walked into the picture. A little sip of wine, folks. Mm, second night, but still a lovely bouquet on the hooter. Then you not only decided to collect garbage around your van, but to start a kind of movement. There was no real plan at the beginning, he responds. 
exactly one year ago, <clears throat> excuse me, I quit my job and started collecting garbage, but I needed a greater sense of purpose. Of course, I can collect five tons of plastic on a deserted beach. Good heavens. But that wouldn't really change anything. People have to see every single cigarette butt and every single piece of plastic that I collect in this way. I can hopefully prod them into reflecting on this problem. And this was why I started an Instagram account called The Trash Traveller, which also includes info on my travels, my ukulele, and above all, fun. Yes, we can't have it all, um, yeah, what, like a moral angle, can we, that makes people thoroughly depressed. And at this point, I'm thinking, oh, no, I'm really putting people off Portugal here. <laughs> if he can collect five tonnes of, of garbage on a beach, then that's not a very good advert for Portugal. But what I would say, it's a bit like when I talk about the pandemic here, it's like this is a problem everywhere in the world, isn't it? And what what the reason I mention it is because I think we've we in this man we have a great and, and inspiring solution again. And and with the pandemic, the reason I mention it is on on the one hand because I think people need to be kept updated, but it's also fair and good to say that Portugal is doing pretty well in in global terms in its response to the pandemic. So I hope this isn't putting you off Portugal. That's not my intention, as you know. Instead, I want to motivate them to think, he continues Andreas, and above all, in a positive, humorous, and sometimes even serious way. I make entertaining videos about a severe problem. I try to package the topic well so that people want to look at my posts. You can't motivate people to pitch in if you put them in a bad mood. Well said, Andreas. My concern is not only about collecting garbage, but what but that we rethink and change our habits. I would love to trigger a transformation with my work. Well, he's, he's done it for me. I mean, I, I just think this guy's amazing. So what do you do with the collected garbage? At first, I threw out the plastic garbage into the designated containers. And I'll, you know, they're amazing in Portugal. And this is what I like to do. When I'm reading an article like this, I like to be able to sort of augment it with some personal experience or, and I invite that from the comments as well. But the the um the, the system is really amazing here and there, there there's like you know a, a garbage collection on every not not every street corner because that would look awful but you know you, you you don't have to go far there's no reason I, I suppose one way of putting it is there's no reason to just throw your rubbish on the floor or dump it you can get to a rubbish collection bin for the general rubbish and recycling very easily. I, even in the countryside, it, it's incredible that how close you are to facilities. <coughs> Excuse me. But, um, you know, our worst fear is that you're chucking it all into, you're sorting it, and then it all ends up in one uh, place anyway, bundled together and burnt somewhere or buried or dumped at sea. So um, this is what he was doing. He was putting it in the designated containers. Then I be became increasingly occupied with this subject. I discovered that worldwide, only 14% of plastic is recycled, a uh, plastic rubbish is recycled. The remaining 86% ends up either burnt or at landfill sites, um, or either burnt at landfill sites or is sent to developing countries. Yeah, uh, I, I won't say too much about that. I mean, just that's grim, isn't it? These countries have become flooded with garbage and they can't even begin to manage it. As a result, it ends up often ends up in the oceans. Even in Germany, the waste management system is not efficient. We have to reduce the quantity of our garbage and turn to sustainable products, he says. I quickly reached a point where I didn't want to put any more garbage in the recycling containers. As here in Portugal, even less than 14% is recycled. In terms of sustainability, we have to mention the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle. As a guiding principle, I regard it as faulty because our focus must be on reducing and reusing. My three R's are reduce, reuse, and refuse. I don't even mention the word recycling anymore. Reducing the amount of garbage and reusing packaging sounds like a lot of effort, and many people therefore think that recycling is just a good an option. Interesting point there. Uh, there simply isn't enough pressure on people to generate less garbage. Most disposable plastic, for instance, isn't recyclable at all. Oh, dear. OK, I hope I'm not depressing you too much. So I think we're coming around to the solution now. Phew. Uh, so if recycling isn't an option, what do you do with all the collected plastic garbage? So we have a story on our hands here, folks. What happened next? Just check with your comments and have a, a sip of tea before I do that. Um, oh, I think I've put everyone to sleep. Uh, why are apartment long term rentals hard to find? Charles asks. I'll come back to that after I've just given you the um, the result of this or, or the upturn and the, the the happy ending, so to speak, 
that's man cave humor uh the happy ending of this story but it's a good question charles and good news is around the corner actually with longer term rentals i think you'll find which is which is good news so this fella i initiated the plastic hike it involves me this is andreas not me carl munson it involves me hiking along the coast of portugal collecting plastic garbage and promoting awareness about our consumption habits Every single piece of garbage that is collected is stored. I work together with various cities, NGOs and surfing schools. In parallel, my team colleagues arrange partnerships with Portuguese artists who make artwork out of everything we've collected. Whatever is left over is used to decorate the exhibition rooms. In every city that I reach along my hike, I meet with artists, hand over the plastic garbage to them and speak with them. While I continue with the hike, they create the artworks. In every city, a local exhibition is organized featuring only one artwork. In 2021, a large exhibition in Lisbon will include all of the participating artists. Fantastic, Andreas. And there he is. Um, what's that called? A snow angel in plastic, I suppose, isn't he? Uh, a tip of an iceberg there. Bottles are the most common items he finds when he's collecting plastic trash at beaches. And um, I think that's a wonderful um, result there and, and a, a very positive spin on it. And he is walking the coast. The whole coast of Portugal. And I, I did try and we had a brief um, connection, uh, a call, not a call, but messaging each other. I was trying to get him on the show. But as you can imagine, he's a, he's a busy fella and he's not always within um, the network to do it. So we might speak to him at some point. But how much has he already collected at the moment? Over 1.3 tonnes. I always update the figure in my Instagram bio. So follow in on, on him on Instagram. And if you want to, to support this wonderful man, uh, there are two ways. One is to accompany me on the plastic hike and join in the garbage collection. So if you ever can come to Portugal, if you're not already here, you could join him for a leg of that journey. It reminds me of that scene in, in Forrest Gump when they're all running with Forrest. Um, and he has the, is it the T-shirt moment? And the it happens moment as well, isn't it? But you can you can walk with this fella with Andreas, a bit like those people ran with Forrest Gump um, on the plastic hike. Uh, he's published a map on his website and indicated various locations where he can be found. So I'll put that in the comments, uh, copy that address. Yeah, but it's also possible to support me remotely on my site. You can find a donation link called Buy Me a Coffee. There, it's possible to treat me to a cup of coffee and donate a garbage bag. I think he's on the same platform that I used to be on. Um, you can even provide financial support for me, my team, and the project. We are working on a documentary film called The Trash Traveller. A small film crew currently accompanies me. It is like the Forrest Gump movie scene. And together we talk to various organizations and listen to the views of people active in the fight against environmental pollution here in Portugal. So a positive approach to a problem, I think, all over the world. It's not about me illustrating the problems to people, but rather that I li also listen to everyone who has something to say. I do like the cut of his jib, I have to say. And look at that surfboard he's made with all those cigarette butts on there. Um, do you call them that? Um, I know that you, you I mean, in England we call them fag ends. You're not going to call them that in America, are you? Um, and But cigarette butts, is that what you call them? Because, um, you know, butt obviously means something quite different in America. I hope I haven't caused a diplomatic or ambassadorial outrage with my choice of words there. And there he is. And um, we should mention Jack Wolfskin. Um, <laughs> he's an influencer because uh, actually they dress him up in their clothes and they tell you which bits, um, what he's working. Look at that. That's the final shot. <laughs> so he's an influencer. <laughs> we were talking about influencers earlier on. Long-term goal, just to finish, I'd like to develop my work further. The whole of next year is already scheduled with projects. I will be taking the documentary and some of the artworks to schools, universities, and various events and giving lectures. So good on this fella. He's turned away from a career in biomedicine into doing the trash, being the trash traveler. Fantastic. But it is a cigarette butt. Um, I object, um, says, where are we, Eugene? In a post-nuclear war world, I am 96% and I will need the... <laughs> Trust Eugene. Uh, I will need those plastic balls to distill fresh water from my urine. Thinking ahead in a kind of Mad Max kind of way there, Eugene. Well done. And you'll need something to keep your pachini in, won't you? Have you guys seen any of the fabulous trash art by Bordello? Uh, I don't know that. Bordello too? Uh, I've seen the raccoon in Lisbon. Yes. I think in, in Agada where I was today, they had a maybe the same artist. Okay. And an octopus, I forget where. So cool. Xander, thank you for mentioning that. I hope your, your healing journey is conti continuing well. Oh, hello, guys. Will's just here as we're about to go. I'll stay for a few more minutes because I want to answer that question from Charles. 
I'm, I'm guessing you're relating to Lisbon. Why are apartment long-term rentals hard to find? Um, the, there's, a, there's a few aspects to that, Charles. Um, we've rented a number of places here in Portugal, and they've all been found not through agents. So the, the picture you're getting, I suspect, is that you're looking via agents um, and you know lettings agencies and estate agents to find a long-term rental. I don't think I don't think they like listing them. I think they're interested in selling houses, and they they have that as part of their shop window, if you like, you know, metaphorically as part of their offer. But the way it seems to work in Portugal is there are lots of rentals, like most uh, European countries. I think most people rent, but it's not something you're going to find necessarily through an agent or you know through a professional um, consultant. It's going to be found by being on the ground and getting a break of some sort with local people. It, it works very much on a grapevine sort of system. Now, that said, it's not going to be that difficult. Uh, not going to be that easy, is it, for you if you're trying to find something from afar? Um, one, one interesting tactic is to approach Airbnb properties and ask them if they will do a longer term. And we found a really great place that was Airbnb and and became a longer term let um, because that was just easier for everyone. So that will be another another tip is to, is to is to say to I mean you know the Airbnb market has crashed, isn't it? So you would imagine that the people who own those properties would be glad of somebody coming to Portugal and and asking for a longer term rental. And in the in the capital, the prices for rentals are coming down. It has crashed. That market has crashed. Where in, in the last two or three years, they were going up and up and up, and it was booming. Things have changed. And I understand, you know, the, 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 um, the picture on the ground is that you can, if you can get there and you can get to talk to local people, you can start to pick and choose because it is a, a crashing market. So, you know, that's not good, um, but that might work for you. It might make it easier for you. So if you can possibly develop some sort of virtual relationship with the area you're thinking of going to get people to put the word out charles is on his way he needs a he needs a rental and look less probably at the agents try olg try facebook you know go in more into sort of community level advertising classifieds and so on but better still go to the community itself and you know literally ask in cafes or in shops, you know, get get known um, in in an area if you possibly can, and ask local, ask a local. Seriously, ask a local. I think so. It seems difficult when you're looking from your point of view, and because none none of the agents seem to have many on their books, and it's a whole rigmarole. Um, that's hard. It looks hard, but lots of people rent here, and it tends to be word of mouth. Hope that helps. I hope that helps, Charles. Uh, <laughs> why are we doing? Mad Max scenarios. Not me, Will. It was Eugene um, that uh, took issue with the plastic recycling. He wants. Uh, so there's another um, destination for your recycled plastic bottles. If Eugene can give us a PO box, uh, we'll deliver as many. We'll, we will feel great and you will feel great. It's a win-win, Eugene, if we can send our empty plastic bottles your way for this scenario you described. You've all been wonderful tonight. I hope I've addressed all of your questions. Uh, this evening and um, I know that Astrid uh, spoke very highly Astrid from Expats Portugal as well my my colleague at expatsportugal.com spoke highly of uh, Campo do Arique as well so I think we're getting quite a lot of um, thumbs up for the person um, I won't out you just in case you don't want to be aired publicly but you, uh, your question has been aired publicly we've done a little bit of work on it and uh, it's looking like um, we like Campo do Arique it has a lot to com to commend it so um thank you for that question other questions most welcome uh, they are the engine of what we do here you know satisfying your 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 <laughs> your personal questions you know what i mean the quest the questions that are going to make your life easier here in portugal not your not the personal personal stuff okay but then again if you want to bring that up up, up on the um in the forum as well you can see how that goes as well have a great rest of your day, uh, American and uh, North American friends, anyone on the other side of the Atlantic who's still enjoying their uh, in Hawaii. You've not even got to lunchtime yet, have you? Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. I'm off to bed now and uh, we'll see you again on the Good Morning Portugal live stream in the morning. Take care.